the first session, we're going to be talking a little bit about just the concepts of development, concepts of autism, and concepts of mental illness and psychiatric disorders um, to ground ourselves um, in, in kind of the basics so we have a framework to understand some of the things that we're going to be talking about clinically uh, as we move forward. Um, in the second session, I'm going to walk you through a couple of cases and it's an uh, opportunity to illustrate some of the complexities of development and mental illness or mental uh, health problems in kids and how we try and disentangle them. And we're actually going to do it a bit counterintuitively, which is in the second session, we're not going to be talking about autism. We're going to be talking about kids that might look like autism. But I think it's really illustrative because it helps us understand some of the things that we're going to be talking about in our third session, which is the same mental health issues in the context of autism and how do we approach them and how do we treat them. So we are going to start, I think, with grounding, is really where are we at now in terms of understanding autism spectrum disorder. As I'm sure most, if not all of you, are aware, we have a new document called the DSM-5, which has shifted around how we understand autism, and it's moved us to this new two-domain model of autism with social and communication deficits on one side and restricted interests and behaviors on the other. But we didn't start there. And I'm not going to give you the whole history here, but I want to just kind of give you as warming up our brains as we think about this, a little bit of the pathway of how we got here. So the, the, the concept of the term autism goes back to the early part of the 1900s. Eugene Bloiler, a, a, um, a Swedish psychiatrist, uh, used the term autism really in the context of seeing individuals with schizophrenia. And he was talking about this withdrawal, which is part of schizophrenia as well, what we call the negative symptomatology of schizophrenia, and derived this term from the Greek of, 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 of self-involved. And this ultimately, in the next uh, couple of decades, really influenced the course of things. Um, and and in, many, in many respects, schizophrenia and uh, in infantile autism were in large, in large degree uh, uh, inseparable at, those po at that point. So let's move forward a couple of decades, several decades, to the early part of the 40s. And there's two people who are key figures at this point. One is in Baltimore, Lee O'Connor, who publishes a uh, paper um, um, describing a series of a number of kids that he talked to, that he saw, where he also uses this term called autistic aloneness and, and, and coins the term infantile autism to describe them. Now, this is different than the Bloiler uh, concept in the sense that this was talking about children. And children still, in the, in the early part of the 40s, um, and, and well uh, past that for that matter, weren't really seen as being conduits for mental illness. Mental illness was still seen as something that came later, that affected people, that in some respects was seen even as a sign of weakness, and, and we had all these cultural values around it. So this was pretty radical. Concurrently, unknown to him, there was another fellow by the name of Hans Asperger in Austria who wrote a very, very similar paper um, and described a very similar set of kids and talked about the lack of empathy and the challenges these kids had forming friendships, the difficulties they had with conversation, reciprocal conversation, uh, the tendency to get really focused on certain areas, and also kind of looked at some of the neurological components and talked about motor clumsiness and so forth. And um, uh, as, as you probably know, Hans Asperger's work was lost for many, many years until rediscovered in the 70s, um, but we'll come back to that. So in that context, the first time that um, classification systems uh, really approached autism was in the DSM-1. Now, this is a very interesting document in and of itself. It came out in the early part of the 50s. The point here for us is that at this point, autism does get included but included within schizophrenia. So it was seen as a childhood version of schizophrenia, schizophrenic reaction was the term that was used. And this, again, is the, the, the overall model that seems to dominate the way we understand autism for a couple of decades, really. Things start to shift in the 70s. And there's two, uh, uh, two threads that make this shift. One shift has to do with some of the overall changes in terms of how mental illness and psychological illness is being seen in the late part of the 60s, which is what we would call psychodynamic. This is the era of Freud. This is the era of Bruno Bettelheim. 
This is the era where people see things as being caused by others as opposed to being innately in, uh, inherent in the individual. And that's how the refrigerator mother concept or partially how the refrigerator mar uh, concept gets, gets, get, gets coined. Well, Michael Rudder, who is still uh, with us and, and publishing, um, uh, published a paper in the 70s where he established that um, uh, infantile, that uh, the children with autism had strong, strong, strong genetic components to them in, in, in using a twin study. Now, this was really revolutionary in the sense that if you had two twins biologically related who were having the same disorder, it really argued against this whole idea of environmentally <laughs> induced autism. And it shifted thinking to really understanding this is perhaps something that is brain-based. This is something that children come into the world with in some respect. Around the same time, we have another psychiatrist who's no longer with us, unfortunately died just last year, a year and a half ago, uh, Lorna Wing um, from, from the UK, who was looking from clinical experience rather than from research uh, 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 data, but was seeing these kids kind of like Connor, kind of like Asperger, and started to group some of the symptoms and coined this idea of a triad, a triad of deficits. And we had this idea then of three domains of be being impacted. Now, it's interesting because Lorna Wing's initial triad is a little different than the triad we ended up with a little bit later. She talked about social interaction, communication, and imagination primarily. Now, DSM-3, which uh, happens in the late part of the 60s, um, is that the right? I think six, sorry, six, early part of the 80s, sorry, uh, uh, really formally changes um, the classification system and we move away from schizophrenia based on this new research from Michael Rudder, these concepts from, um, uh, from Lorna Wing and so forth. And the term infantile autism is for the first time introduced as a separate category within a new category called pervasive developmental disorders. And this starts another kind of trajectory and historical path, path for, for, for classification. Um, and, and in this, we, the, 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 the criteria are similar to what was being talked about by Lorna Wing and, and by Michael Rudder and by Connor and so, so forth, the lack of responsiveness to others, language issues, and some atypical responses to environmental triggers. Fast forward to DSM-4, and at this point, there's a, there's a pathway, and the, the, this idea of a triad gets more fully elaborated into what we see here. And as you can see, now we have three domains in DSM-4, which are called per pervasive developmental disorder, social, communication, and repetitive behavior. So you can see that there's already been a shift. The triad idea is retained, but what happens is that it's split up in a little bit different way. And so social behaviors and social interaction with specific criteria are elaborated, communication behaviors, and imagination is lumped into that um, uh, as well. And then this pattern restricted interests and behaviors. Now DSM-4 was actually a pretty good uh, starting point, or a pretty good uh, waypoint, I should say, uh, for autism. This is the, 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 the old triad, or the, the old uh, Venn diagram that we used, to, we used to think about. And why was DSM good? Well, because actually when they looked at the initial studies and they normed it, it actually was very sensitive, it was very specific, meaning that it was pretty good uh, picking up kids that, need, that had autism, and it was pretty good at ruling out kids who did not, ha did not have autism, and it was pretty reliable meaning that two people looking at the same child, applying the same criteria, would come to the same conclusion. Those are the three kind of key ingredients of any diagnostic scheme. So a child within PDD, as opposed to off PDD, it was a pretty reliable, accurate exercise. You could, we, we, just using the criteria, the research indicated we could keep kid, we could, we could determine which kids were on the spectrum or within PDD and who were not. That's kind of where things fell apart. And so the other part of DSM is that it, it really elaborates subtypes in a much more detailed way of autism spect or of, of pervasive developmental disorder, particularly Asperger syndrome and PDD-NOS. PDD-NOS is one of these categories, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which um, uh, the NOS category accompanied almost every diagnostic grouping within DSM. And it was basically a recognition that nature does not like boundaries. 
that nature does not define things in clear lines. And so there were always these kind of gray marginal cases in almost every diagnostic schema, and there needed to be some place to try and capture these kids. And so the solution in, 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 in the past had been to create this almost um, lack of a, forgive, forgive the pejorative term, this garbage can kind of category. But the problem with it was that it was too vague. And it was used in a very, very different way by, very, by different people. And as a result, the main issue was that it was not reliable. So it, the, the, I, I, I refer to, to one study here where, where they uh, uh, had two, uh, they, they looked at kind of the reliability of the diagnosis of autism versus PDD NOS. So just think about what happened here is you have a child go into a room assessed by expert A. Expert A does a lovely assessment and concludes the child has an autistic spectrum disorder, or has, has autism, sorry, has autistic disorder. Goes next door, child's a little tired yet, but goes next door and sees expert B for a second opinion. Expert B comes to the conclusion the child has PDD-NOS. The likelihood of these two experts doing the same thing was less than chance. Now, that's kind of interesting because it's pretty hard to get less than chance. Right? And, but it also implies that you might as well flip a coin and not have two expensive experts who are trying to debate with each other. But it also brings up the question is, really, if this is that vague and the experts can't determine what's what, how important is this? The other thing that happens is this creation of, of uh, this, this, this new diagnosis called Asperger's disorder. And in, 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 and in reality, Asperger's at this point is really created out of whole cloth. There is absolutely no evidence of Asperger's existing at this point. It's based on a few people who have some interest in what might be called higher functioning autism or might be called um, uh, 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 autism without an intellectual disability, but there really isn't any data on it before DSM-4 is published. As we all know, though, as soon as 1994 turns the corner, the numbers of Asperger's kids start to show up. But, and, and, and in the years that follow DSM-4, what is, what is learned is that um, there, there, the, the, the initial impressions that there weren't any, any clear defining boundaries between Asperger's and other autism spectrum disorders or PDDs becomes quite clear. And there, there isn't any evidence produced that uh, Asperger's differs from autism, uh, autistic disorder or PDD NOS based on ideological or causation, based on course or longitudinal development or based on treatment response or anything. So, again, the question then comes up, well, if you can't really see how these things are different, what is the value of, 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 of determining uh, uh, subtypes? In 2000, there's a little bit of a revision in what's called the SM4TR, it's a text revision, and they do a little bit of an attempt to try and clarify um, some of the language in DSM-4 with the PDD-NOS and with Asperger's, which is still very vague. It doesn't really help very much, but what I think really happens in DSM-4TR is the completion of the swing of a pendulum which is that over the course from DSM-3 through DSM-4 and into DSM-4-TR, what you end up seeing, and this happens all through society, is that in autism, when people think about autism, what people start to think about much more, what people start to emphasize much more, are the social and communication deficits. Those get highlighted. Those actually are the key. And in fact, in the context of the rising emphasis on social and communication deficits, what ends up happening is the other part of it is that there's lesser and lesser emphasis on the restricted interests and repetitive behaviors, that other arm of autism. And as a result, in DSM-4-TR and in DSM-4, you can actually get a diagnosis of a PDD without having evidence of any restricted interests or repetitive behaviors. So, DSM-5 comes along. There's a, and in the preparation for it, there's a number of working groups that are established. Um, and there's one on the neurodevelopmental group who work on autism. And they're given a task, uh, a number of tasks uh, in this working group. Work, these working groups are essentially in, in national, international experts who meet by phone or around tables um, uh, several times per year over a period of a number of months and then through their thinking and their, their, their research and um, uh, 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 the literature review, they come to uh, some definition on the new criteria. Uh, 
So their tasks were to figure out how we were going to describe ASD within a spectrum of disorders. Now this idea of an autism spectrum disorder had taken hold by this point. In fact, we in BC were well ahead of the game. We in, in 2003 had shifted over from autistic disorder, PDD, NOS, as a funding category, as an eligibility category, to ASD, to autism spectrum disorder, as part of the standards and guidelines. And so in some ways, the world was catching up with BC. At the same time, the problem is with the term autism spectrum disorder is it has a whole other set of issues, which is it implies that autism is actually a spectrum, meaning that it has a curve evolved with it. And we're starting to understand maybe that perhaps that's not the best term for it. In any case, it was, it was so, uh, so, it was so well used and so popular at that point, the term had been adopted. The second was that all across DSM, um, um, the, the NOS category was being eliminated. They said, we, this, 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 the solution we had with NOS is not going to work. We've got to change that. So you've got to get rid of PDD NOS, meaning that the kids who previously might have been identified with PDD NOS, you've got to figure out what to do with them. Are they going to stay uh, in the new schema? Would they be classified as autism? Or where do they go? Solving the Asperger's problem. Meaning, basically, what are we going to do? We now have created hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals who are self-identifying with a syndrome that perhaps the science doesn't even support exists. What are we going to do about that? Do we just continue along with this facade to some degree, or do we try to make a change, and what is the meaning of that change? And the final thing, the task was, it was increasingly uh, um, uh, evident by that point that there was over-identification of autism going on, particularly in certain populations of kids. And one of the major populations, kids that we're going to be talking about today, are kids with psychiatric comorbidities. And it was clear that this was something that the schema from DSM-4 uh, and 4TR had not uh, 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 done very well and needed to do a better job in DSM-5. 